so I'd like to welcome everybody tonight uh, to this program. Um, my name is Heath. Uh, I'm the adult services librarian at the Morrill Memorial Library. Uh, and I would like to extend our thanks to the Mass Cultural Council um, who has helped to fund this program. Uh, they're a state agency that um, uh, is supporting this program through their 2024 um, Festivals and, and Projects Grant Program. And their funds actually reach every community in the Commonwealth. Uh, the Council's mission is to promote excellence, education, access, and diversity in the arts, humanities, and sciences, to improve the quality of life for all Massachusetts residents, and to contribute to the vitality of our communities and economy. Uh, so some lofty goals being met here tonight. Um, I am so pleased to uh, say hello tonight to Tori Stevens, uh, coming back to give another program for us. Uh, Tori creates opportunities that transform organizations and shift culture. He's the resource generator and community builder for social justice issues, people and movements, uh, and working at Grist Magazine. Um, he is their climate fiction creative manager and uses storytelling to champion climate justice and imagine green, clean, and just futures. So Tori, uh, welcome back. We're, we're so glad to see you again. Thanks for having me. I guess I'll take it away. Thanks for that intro. Thanks for the Mass Cultural Council for their supportive dollars for art and literature and beautiful storytelling and talking all things environment. So I'll intro myself a little bit. I'm Tori Stevens, and I am the creative manager of climate fiction at Grist Magazine, which is an independent online magazine news organization that is fo solely focused on the climate crisis. But the way we come at the climate crisis from a news angle is we talk about ho hope, solutions, and uh, the climate, obviously. So I'm not a journalist, but I work in the storytelling side of the business. And I call it a business, even though we're a nonprofit. Um, and I've been doing that for about four years now. Uh, I manage a project called Imagine 2200, which has really taken off since it started. It We ask people to submit stories from all over the globe. And every year we get around a thousand something stories and we read those stories, we dissect them, we discuss them, and then we publish the best of them. We have a whole process. I'll get into the process. But in the end, and we just published our most recent collection, our third, um, there's some books that have come out after, um, from the collection. The collection, the first year's collection was turned into a book called Afterglow, and it's excellent. You can also just read those stories for free on our website. And then we have another book coming out in the fall of this coming fall, which will be a collection of years two and three, the best stories from years two or three, or the ones that I hold together. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, how, my personal story, because um, I think that there's some lessons there that I've learned that I want to share with you, the audience, about how did I end up in climate storytelling, why I think it's important, and why I think it's a climate solution. And then I'll also talk about visioning, which I know that doesn't really seem like something that would be coming up in this sort of talk, but it was crucial in us developing this project. The visioning process was um, really a, an energy of creative energy that helped us kind of um, pull this all together and have a project called Imagine 2200. It definitely would have been a different project if we didn't have this intense three-day visioning session that happened right before or right at the start of COVID. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then I'll talk about the importance of hope and why we lean into hope for this project. Like, wh why why don't we accept dystopian stories? Why don't we um, accept stories that don't have solutions? I'll talk about that and why I think it's important for the future and for us uh, to get out of this climate crisis. So 
I'll start with my personal story just a little bit. I've been, for many years, I was a fundraiser um, for health advocacy organizations like AIDS Action Committee of Massachusetts and another, then I moved on to a national organization called Community Catalysts, which launched advocacy campaigns to protect Medicare and Medicaid, and then also um, the Affordable Care Act. These, the folks that I worked with actually were the folks that uh, wrote the original Affordable Care Act, Romney Care, and got it passed in this state um, way back. And so what does that have to do with storytelling? Well, when I was a fundraiser, I was the person who wrote those appeals. The now Actually, I'm going to date myself, but I'm um, when I did this, it was mainly sending letters. And then I started a transition where you would get a letter, but then also an email so that it was like an omni-channel marketing campaign. And that was the big buzzword. But I would sit with people and listen to their story, like folks who are living with HIV and AIDS, What? how does that impact their health, their life, their family, their, um, just their community, you know, talk to me, tell me. And so those folks would, I would interview them and I would learn a lot about people in, a, in this one person that I'm sitting across from and the big debate um, at the time was, whether you should lead with statistics or lead with a story um, that, you know, like a human interest story, like what I'll use Brenda as like a fake person, like why Brenda, um, why, why she needs her life-saving HIV AIDS care, you know? And I was on the side that human interest story, stories that just really show you what your funding is going to go towards. Like, I didn't think that statistics were powerful, you know, you'll be able to help you know, a letter that says you're going to be able to help 100,000 people. I don't know if people can kind of grasp those numbers, but they can grasp Brenda and her um, child are living in this home and without this life care and saving medicine, her health will be impacted and that will also impact her family and her daughter, you know, something like that. So at the same time, there was I don't know if you know this, but there's this, um, it, it's kind of known now, it's called Humans of New York. It was a photographer, storyteller, who um, just would pick a random person on the street in New York and then do a deep dive, like, you know, interview them and find out about their story. And they were interesting. And they caught on like wildfire. I think there's like a book and everything. And years later, it has like 10 million, you know, um, likes on its Facebook page. And so this is something that I I was, you know, looking at and I was saying, you know what, I want to do this human of New York style interview stories for AIDS action. And then I did that for Community Catalyst and we shifted away from, you know, all this statistics, statistics leading and telling the story. So I'm telling you all this because I've been a storyteller for a while and it was in the fundraising sphere, but that's where I cut my teeth. And that's where I learned that the power of storytelling to be a, a, a medium for advocacy, not just for entertainment and not just for, you know, normal communication. It can be those things, of course, but I, I thought it was really interesting how um, fundraising and advocacy uh, through storytelling kind of intersected and helped uh, energize a movement or a people um, to get things done, to protect Medicaid, to protect Medicare, to uh, defend the Affordable Care Act when it was on, and you know, really it was John McCain coming out with his thumbs down and, um, you know, the advocacy, it, it, everyone saw the like thumbs down moment, but what they didn't see was all the storytelling that we were pushing and gathering in red states to tell the story of healthcare. So, and why Medicaid, Medicare, and the Affordable Care Act is important. And so that's where I learned about um, the power of storytelling and really got into storytelling as like a advocacy thing. And that's where I feel like I grew into becoming an advocate. So fast forward, I move on to from health advocacy to climate advocacy and working at a news organization because I felt like for me, that was the next big place I wanted to put my energy. 
And I also felt there was a lot of intersections with health. I really wanted to, you know, I care about um, public health and people's health. And so I, instead of just um, continuing on and kind of protecting Medicaid and Medicare and um, the Affordable Care Act, I uh, wanted to move into this place where I saw a lot of energy. And that was, and I thought also, I do believe it's an existential crisis, the climate crisis. And so I really wanted to put my energy in that. And so, and then this is where I'll get into the, where the visioning uh, around what Imagine 2200 could be. I was invited by Grist to meet with a whole bunch of climate solution focused individuals across the nation here in Massachusetts. And, you know, these are, there was so many different types of people, help farmers, um, politicians, activists, scientists, like tech bros, I guess you would call them or tech people. Um, and so all these different people, but the main thing that brought them together is they were all working on different solutions uh, for the climate, you know, and so at the end of this conversation, after hanging out with these people for two and a half days on this really beautiful, expansive place in New Hampshire, so it wasn't in Massachusetts, it was in New Hampshire, um, and, you know, talking about different solutions and getting to know each other, on the last day, the founder of Grist said, you know, Grist would like to make a move into doing something different. You know, we're reaching a lot of people millions of people um, with our news. We've won awards and beat out the New York Times in different categories at you know various times. And But I feel like there's a group of people we're not reaching. And one of those people or sectors or you know demographics is you know we weren't really reaching red state folks and we weren't reaching people who just are turned off from the news. So we put that to the group of people and we said, go into small groups, and, you know, kind of brainstorm around ideas that Gris could launch that would be interesting, new, exciting, and different that could reach these, you know, either, you know, folks in kind of red states or climate deniers um, or climate skeptics or folks that are kind of like turned off from the news. And one of the groups that came back said, we think Gris should do climate fiction because, you know, people who don't like the news might like like a good story and you already have editors at your um, organization, you deal with like words and things. So it's not a big jump to kind of, you know, it's not like a whole new thing. We're not going to create like a sneaker company. You know, it's like, this makes sense. Um, you have editors, you have lots of writers, you might not write these stories, but you know how to like, you know, review them and whatnot. So we sat on that for like a year with me working in the background as like the main project person to figure out you know, should we move in this direction, have conversations internally at Grist, talk to folks, does it make sense? How much would it cost? Things of that nature. I said, let's bring together another group, but the focus of the whole three, two day retreat, three day retreat would be just to talk about climate fiction before we, we're not going to launch, I didn't feel like we should launch this new product, this new uh, kind of vertical, I guess what, that's what we call it in the business without kind of exploring it with people outside of grist, you know, sometimes it can become where you get on this ladder of, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And that's the buzz that's inside the place. I wanted to check this with outside folks. And so I brought together some people, the climate solution focused individuals, and we designed a visioning quest where the question on the table for them was, if we do climate fiction, what type of climate fiction should we do? So what should it be and what should it not be was the choice. Like, let's th let's have a thought experiment around like what that will be, a conversation. And so the way we designed it was quite interesting. I had this facilitator who helps facilitate um, retreats and whatnot, who had a lot of great ideas. And one of them I really liked, which was he, I'm not someone who played Dungeons and Dragons when I was younger. So this was, you know, I think I found out about more about it in Stranger Things than I did like in life. Um, and so, but he had, and he said, what if we combined a visioning exercise, a visioning quest of sorts with the mechanics of like a role-playing game? We'll send four different people that don't know each other. Again, that 
help farmer, um, a scientist, a lawyer, um, and an activist, and you know different configurations of the people that were there. And there was all these different talents that you bring to the table as someone who's a um, activist versus someone who is a politician or policy wonk. And you know, so you have all these different you know ideas. And so the goal of the visioning quest was the way we would get their ideas out of their brain was through this game. But we also had them plot ideas and moments in scenes like they could write up a scene on a sticky or a moment in time between um at the time it was uh 2020 and 2200 which is why we got the name imagine 2200 we gave them this big expansive uh bucket uh in time so that they aren't constrained by you need to get this done in six months you know like these what what's gonna what be the big arc to get us to a clean, green, and just world by 2200. So they could they went on this quest three days. They had a, a guide or like a dungeon master, but I think we call it we called it the portal master or something. I don't know. I forget. But um, the point is is that visioning really helped supercharge this project. If I had by myself, without the collective ideas of these 25 people, thought of climate fiction. I maybe would have come up with something cool, but there was a lot of ideas that I would not have brought to the table because they're, they're just not ones that I was holding close to me at the time. So a good example is like, we had some folks that were um, interested. It's funny when I'm going to say this is that many of the ideas we brought to kind of bring in and be what our climate fiction would be were ideas that you don't really associate with the climate. Um, and let me explain. So folks who believe in the abolition movement, so folks who want to, um, not the one from like slavery times, but the modern abolition movement is a group of individuals who do not believe in prisons and believe in other ways of um, correcting people's behavior. And um, they wouldn't even call it punishment. There's a sort of dialogue that has to happen be between the victim and the person who harmed them. Um, so I, that was not on the table for me. I wouldn't have thought that, you know, there would be a climate fiction story that has like this justice imbued idea of abolition. Um, there's a some indigenous folks are in the room. And so uh, at the time, and even still, there's a movement called the land back movement, which is really focused on granting and ceding land that was indigenous lands back to them. Um, and so that movement was something that, you know, and when I say like we add these to our climate fiction collection, what I do is when there's a call for submissions and we put out the call to the world, I put some descriptive things like this doesn't have to just be a disaster story. We want the intersectional, the different ways that a lived a, a person like the things that they care about aren't just the climate. Like even you sitting there right now, maybe the climate is your number one um, issue at the top of your mind when it comes to like politics, movements, and you know your issue focus that you have as a person. But maybe it's number four, right? And maybe abolition is like number one or something like that. So there was all these like justice ideas that um, ended up on the table. There were all these um books and uh movements that people recommended that i get in touch with and read and meet with like some of the people behind those movements like afrofuturism and gulf like from the middle eastern states gulf futurism queer futurism and the reason they said that i should meet with these folks and like get in touch and kind of understand this literary movements and larger movements is because these type of movements lead without they're unapologetic about the, the like they're not performing for um a gaze of another uh you know like the white gaze like that is often talked about you know they're performing and creating art black like afrofuturist black art for black people gulf futurism middle eastern art for um middle eastern folks and the reason that they said that there was some interesting nuggets in there is that the things they liked is that folks were celebrating difference, 
you know, we all have our cultures in food ways and um, ways of dressing and praying. And those things are beautiful. And that's what makes us like human and different. And so just seeing how those are celebrated after reading like Afrofuturism, solar punk, these different kinds of movements, I, I realize this is a project we want that is celebrating identity, different people's identities and um, is not something that is, I call it like, you know, cardboard or paper, you know, like I really want the characters in our story to be not like Lego people where you could just pop their heads off and switch them and it wouldn't matter, uh, you know, because like if the character to the story is Brazilian and they eat this type of food and their world looks like this, it wouldn't make sense to kind of pop in like a French guy's, you know, head, you know, like you can't just Lego people them. So, um, at, but back to the visioning, just that, those were some of the, like, I guess, intelligence, like that's how I think about it is intelligence gathering kind of research that I was doing and kind of getting in this world, this stew of ideas that were not my own ideas. And I think that's the important part that made this like super collaborative and visioning helped that it allowed people to kind of just forget the restraints of like what you can and, you know, power dynamics be gone. You know, you, you four people on this quest are going to get us to a clean, green and just world. What are the things that need to happen? And so at the end of those three days, I had five different timelines created by, there was like groups of four and groups of five, but I had all that information and I had like two and a half months to kind of distill it, think about it, and then create a like, I don't know, 750 word prompt that would help you know talk to the world about like what type of stories we're looking for and where we landed were we want hopeful climate solution focused stories that are intersectional so that people's identities aren't left on the cutting room floor you know if you are um you know, let's just use like it could be like a gay black man writes story and, you know, it, the story is about the climate, but it's also about that person being a gay black man, which is OK with us. We're not um, that's the kind of stories we want. We want stories that are intersectional or a story about a mom, you know, in um, what it's like to be a mom um, and also be an activist climate person, you know, like, but, but the, the, the focus doesn't have to be, there could be this like dual or even like triple or quadruple layer to a person because we all have so many layers to ourselves. It's, we don't want these like kind of cardboard climate fiction stories where the character themselves doesn't have these other intersectional pieces of themselves in the story. We feel like that is something that makes our characters exciting and relatable. So I said, hopeful climate solutions, intersectional, uh, culturally authentic. So this is a global contest. Uh, so we get stories from all over and yeah, we want culturally authentic stories. Like in the future, there will be culture. Like often portrayed in science fiction is like this kind of aesthetic of like, it's very clean. People are wearing like uniforms that have to be the same i think star wars does a decent job and sometimes star trek like where the um there's like a culture to the aliens or the people on different worlds or whatever but there is this like science and the reason i bring up science fiction because cl climate fiction is an offshoot it's a speculative you know uh storytelling that's similar to science fiction um but focused on the climate and so we thought it was important that, you know, if somebody from Malaysia, you don't have to write this kind of, you, you can write a story that's not um, where everyone's like in a uniform and like, no, we want your cultures. Your culture culture will be in the future, like, you know, food ways and um, burials and, you know, the way you greet someone, like those things are going to last, you know, if anything, humans are going to create culture. So that's a, another piece that we really wanted in there. And so, and then, so when I present like the prompt and like the call for submissions, which is, it's a, so what is that? If you're not in the literary world and managing a contest, I, I live and breathe this stuff. So I always have to explain just so that others know 
we put out a call for submission, which is three months long. And it describes like, if you're going to create an imagine 2200 type story and win this initiative, um, win the $3,000 in publishing, um, and maybe even a book deal, you have to, you know, try to create stories that lean into the things that I was just talking about, hopeful, um, sprinkled with climate solutions that make sense and are cool, um, and culturally authentic and intersectional. And the fifth one is that it has to be a damn good story. So with all those things at play, um, you know, I've created this prompt that's, you know, anywhere from 750 to a thousand words, which explains what we're looking for. But also in that, I threw in some of the knowledge that I had gathered from the um, visioning quest. And yeah, I feel like that's important. People see that there's these like works, um, these movements that they can rely on and kind of look to, to get more information around the type of story that we would like. And so in the prompt, it talks about Afrofuturism. It talks about the solar punk community. Um, and I suggest you also look into these. Like I've found them so helpful. Um, the solar punk, which is not one that I had mentioned earlier, is is now a movement. It's not just a literary project. There's artists, there's people who are trying to create solar punk like gadgets and widgets that actually help us in life. Um, these are just like badass people trying to kind of fix their way out of the climate crisis, one small issue at a time, but also big issues. And then there's all these storytellers that are like, wait, I want to play in the climate, the solar punk space. And so what they did is they kind of bring together the characters that they know in real life that are doing these solar punky things. Um, and the other part about the solar punk community, it's very open um, and people are um, egalitarian and accepting and celebrate difference. And many of the stories, sometimes people call them utopian, but if you look under the hood, they're not utopian. They're more of a throughtopia. And that's a term that's come out of the UK probably like three years ago, where it's maybe we're on the road to getting to like a better world. And you can see that humanity and the characters in the story have kind of like turned the page. And, you know, you know, there's still some pollution or a good amount of it because of all that we've done to society, to this world. Um, but they know that they're at some point in the future, it's going to be cleaner, greener, and more just. And so they're working towards that. It's not utopian where everything is completely um, figured out and there's no issues. We accept stories that are utopian but um, with the project, but most of them, I would say, aren't. Um, but we do have some. And so... Yeah, that's that's the prompt. That's how uh, it's laid out. It's just like this, um, some of the background on the things that I was like uh, deep diving into, the points we want them to hit to make an imagined story. But then after that, they can play. And so that's the next piece I want to talk about, the imagination and why it's important to, why, why, why am I doing this? Why do I have this focus on stories and how do I think it's helpful for getting us out of the uh, climate crisis, right? I don't think it's like the, you know, one thing that'll help us. I think it's a part of the tapestry of things that we'll need to get out of it. And I think it's one that we're not using a lot of at all. So there was some research I'm friends or colleagues or in, in community I'll use with a group called Good Energy. I'm going to put their um, URL because they're really cool and like what they're doing is great. So good energy. Where's my chat? Here we go. Um, here we go. I'll just put the thing there. So check that out on your own time or even now if you want. But good energy is a advocacy organization and policy shop. They have some solutions that they're trying to push. So I would say advocacy light policy. Um, not policies in government, but like ideas they want to get in the world and they're advocating for. Um, and so the thing they're advocating for is more storytelling in the climate space. And they're also shining a light on the idea that uh, they did a study with a university partner where they looked at 32,000 scripts in the last like 15 to 20 years. I might get that wrong, but 
in general, they looked at a lot of different scripts coming coming out of Hollywood. And out of 32,000, only a thousand of them in the last like 15 to 20 years had climate um, plots, narratives, storylines. And, you know, these are, this is Hollywood. Some of the best storytellers in the world, like who have generate billions of dollars and get pe entertain people and get ideas out there. And yet they, I, it translated to like 2.8% of stories um, streaming, streaming or, you know, Hollywood stories, big blockbusters, whatever things we watch. Um, 2.8% of those stories were about the climate, right? But then if I asked you how many of those are about crime or um, romance or um, like horror, like I'm, they have higher statistics than this thing that's a like a existential crisis, you know, and we have the best storytellers. So it's not like, you know, I mean, Hollywood does because like people are attracted to it and pays well. And like, so people gravitate towards it. And yet this thing that's like, it's not that it's too complex. Like, I don't know the reason why it hasn't gotten its play. Um, but those folks at Good Energy are um, advocating so that there can be more climate stories in Hollywood and, you know, in other spaces. I'm doing that in other spaces. I will say that I'm also on the Hollywood Climate Summit Advisory Board, which is doing a similar thing. Um, they work hand in hand with Good Energy. And yeah, I felt like this was the thing that was happening in the literary space is that um, climate fiction is, I would say there's probably more than 2% then uh, there's, things are going a lot better in that space, I would say there's a climate fiction, you know, there, it's called it's a genre, you know, there's I don't really yes, there's some genre films, you could call climate fiction films in Hollywood. But that's because climate fiction on the book side, the literary side, created the genre. And now you can say like there's this genre. Um, but it didn't spring from Hollywood because I think they're behind. But in the uh, on the book side of things, when I was doing a deep dive and reading the stories that folks would say like, oh, you got to read this one, you got to read that one. They were dystopian or like, you know, focus on disasters. Um, and so after creating the prompt, I was like, wow, what if the investment had been in the last years, us to focus on hope, solutions, and, you know, culturally authentic characters and intersectionality because people are layered. Uh, where would we be then? Where would we be now? You know, and why do I have so much hope in storytelling? Well, there's two reasons. One is I used to see the power of it when I was a fundraiser and a advocate um, raising funds for those causes that I was talking about earlier, healthcare, HIV, AIDS, Medicaid, Medicare, um, the Affordable Care Act. It helped it, you know, the storytelling helped. It moved the needle. It, it helped you empathize with the people on this. You typically, well, when I was doing letters, um, some of those letters jumped onto the, to they became like ad campaigns. So instead of like some great people would turn like the, whoa, this is a great, um, you know, appeal. That's what they call them. The letters that come in the mail for charity. You And they would turn it into like a video um, where the person's talking to you. And then that worked for like Facebook. And then after that, they'd ask for a donation. But that's that's one part of it. Then the other part of it is that I was evangelical when I was younger. I'm not evangelical anymore, but any good re religious boy knows that like the whole, like a lot of it is storytelling. Like, how did I understand the morals? How did I understand the, you know, the faith? It's like, at least my upbringing and how I was brought into the religion was through these stories, you know, like my pastor would stand up there and tell stories. And, you know, if you look back at history, religion, story, religions, religious storytelling has driven people to do so many things, um, good and bad. And so the power of story is something that I think is, um, you know, clearly the one of the best ways that humans communicate um, with each other. And I think that it's an underutilized climate solution. And so what do I mean by that is that I think that we're not, you, yes, you could point to the fact that and I work at a news organization that has been doing, Grist has been around, actually, it's our 25th year. So we've been doing this for 25 years, folks that were there before I. And they, 
I would say that it's been a success to kind of get the, the statistics and the news and keep people informed about their environment and the climate and where we are. But we're still having trouble with the narrative that we can get out of this crisis. We can win. We need to change what we're doing. We need to focus on climate solutions and that at the bottom of this, there could be a hopeful story. And so I want to help get that narrative going. And the only way to get that narrative going is through like what I call the thousand, maybe even a million points of light um, uh, strategy. And so the million points of light are different stories, right? You have the TikToks of the world, you have Hollywood, you have um, regular like TikToks, I call it like regular social media. And then there's TikTok because TikTok's just like on a whole nother level because it, it's just a cut above the rest, but in, in how much it gets people active in, um, talking. Um, and so you have books, you have, um, blogs, you know, you, we need more storytelling for people to imagine and envision the world we want. And instead of like, you know, disaster flick when it comes to climate fiction. So I always say this thing, and I heard someone else say it the other day, uh, good energy. Um, so great minds, I guess, think alike. <laughs> um, um, they said that climate storytelling is only useful if folks share it and talk about it and discuss it, right? And I think that stories are the things like, you know, we, I, I remember leaving the United States for a little while. I, um, in 2001, again, dating myself, I traveled around the world and um, I was gone for nine months, went to a whole bunch of countries, a lot of fun, met with some family members, friends on the way. When I came home, I forgot how much Americans talk TV, right? And so I was completely out of the loop. Like I felt weird at like, like my first, like, you know, uh, I don't know, dinner party or like party with friends and whatever. And when I was trying to like jump in and I'm a small talk kind of person, like, you know, I, I can do the small talk thing. I realized then like, wow, I like can't, like, I just don't know. A lot of people talk shows, you know, like that's what they talk. That's their orientation. And so with all that, like religion, the, what I talked about regarding religion, what I talked about advocacy and fundraising, just what I believe in my heart as like how powerful storytelling is. We need to invest in climate storytelling. And, and I'm not making a pitch to you. I'm not saying like, you know, I need your money or whatever. I'm just saying we as humans need to, create more that we need that million points of light you know we need you know folks in uh southern india telling their story of you know how do they clean up their world and um get off of fossil fuels and get plastics out of the system we need that from in malaysia indonesia like climate storytelling and it, it has to be exciting and fun like i want the next new spider-man movie to be you know the exciting one with like um you know, they have Miles Morales now, uh, the cartoon, and then they have um, the movies. But why not have like the bad guy be like someone who is either um, contributing to the demise of our planet now that we know that fossil fuels do that? It's it's not like a secret. Um, and, or, 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 you know, just narratives that have to do with like uh, the climate and maybe not a superhero fixing them because I'm all about community. So <laughs> Spider-Man might not have been like the best choice for uh, an example, but you get the point. Like we, there's these opportunities where we could be talking about this stuff um, and having a conversation among society, not just in the science and news and political space, but break this open into the pop culture space, right? It's not happening in a big way. And like, imagine 2200 as a project that's just like a small, um, I wouldn't even call it a band-aid, but we're one of those thousand, one of those million points of light, right? And so we're just trying to chug along and help others and, um, you know, see that this is the type of climate storytelling that we want. In, in no way that I'm saying like dystopian stories are bad, right? They offer a huge lesson 
of what not to do or what you don't want in your society. Like oftentimes, I mean, some I'm, if people always think like, I only read like hopeful stories, like, no, and some of my favorite stories are like dystopian stories. It's just that the balance is wrong for every dystopian story or, you know, for every 10, there's probably one hopeful story, right. That deals with climate change or um, humans, non early demise. So yeah, that, that's kind of like, so I've made the case for why I think storytelling's uh, important. I talked a little bit about my background and why I'm kind of here in this situation. Um, and then I talked about the visioning process, which is something that I think like, if you had asked me when I was in fundraising and in, I guess advocacy to me is a little bit politics because you're trying to influence policy. So when I, I always say when I was in politics or whatever, but if you'd asked me about visioning then, I would have said it's a bunch of like woohoo. Like I, I just did not believe in the power of visioning, but I, I learned something at the beginning of the pandemic with those people is that I was able to like enter their dream space and play with their dream seeds and inspect them and be like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about, you know, cause the, the way we set it up was there was a goal for the world to be clean, green and just. But the points between that is like so different from person to person. Like, what are the things that you need? And so if you want to try this, you can try this exercise at home. You can write out a timeline and try to think of the big things that would have to happen. 2050, all cars are electric. Maybe it's earlier than that for you or whatever. Um, you know, and just plot the things that really need to happen. And it kind of just that exercise is something that it was cool to be able to do it in a collective way. And I really think that people should be doing it collectively because you're going to get ideas that you didn't um, come up on your own. And so I think we have about 17 minutes left. Um, I'm going to keep talking for a little bit and then I can open it, open it up for questions. Um, and I hope you all have questions. Feel free to ask me about the current project, past projects, climate fiction, um, and you know, even like personally, like, you know, and like, I don't know, things about Grist or the managing the project or um, behind the scenes stuff. I'm happy to kind of talk about that. I think it's fun and interesting. And maybe there's some other storytellers here. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll talk to you about before I transition to questions is about the art that we do for Imagine 2200. So it's, we have these written stories um, and but from the beginning, I thought that like many of the literary magazines that are online, they don't also commission illustrations because it's expensive, right? Like for the price that I pay for an illustration, I could probably publish two more stories, which is a little bit wild. But I grew up reading comic books. I would even say that between the Bible, <laughs> um, the Bible, like religious studies and comic books, that's how I became literate. And um, I always love that they illustrate the stories because it just, it, 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 uh, there's just something, the, I love the fact that the artist can play in that world too, in a different way than the writer does. And so um, we invested in um, really beautiful illustrations for each of the stories. So if you go to imagine, um, if you go to Grist and then search Imagine 2200 or Climate Fiction, you'll be able to find um, and I think that Heath also put the link up here so you'll be able to find the stories, but I'm going to put the about section because the, that has every single story that we've published over the past four years. I would bookmark this page. And, um, one thing I always tell people is that you can listen to the stories too. So if you're walking the dog or if you're going on a hike, or if you just want to listen to a story in your bed, instead of like reading it at the top of the story somewhere, you'll be able to find a, a button and some of the stories are actually have voice actors. Recently, we switched over to AI because it was so expensive for the voice actors. And we really want to keep this program going and the stories getting to market. And so, but the voices sound really good. Um, so yeah, we really just, you know, I, I would suggest check out those stories um, and check out the art that we commissioned and look at those visions, look at read the stories. Um, if you have anything interesting that you want to like email me, you can email me and just, I've always loved to hear what people think of a story. 
because it's weird when you're, I guess, yeah, it's weird when you're publishing a collection. I don't get much outside feedback. The cool part, and then I'll transition to questions, is the book. Us putting out Afterglow. Um, if you want to take a look at Afterglow, I'll put that in the chat too. Afterglow climate fiction. Um, but that's the only time I started to get feedback around these stories outside of like people that work at Grist. Excuse me. Did not mean a verb. Um, so like because Goodreads, like the book is reviewed there. It has a 4.1 or something like that. And people write. And I was like, wow, this is what someone like actually thinks of these stories. So that's I, I put in the about page in the chat. The about page has like all three collections and then the editor's picks that we've done. So we've produced stories that are independent of the winners of the the contest. Um, and uh, so you'll be able to find all three collections, the people who won for year one, two, and three, and then the stories that I selected that I thought were cool out of, you know, the 3000 stories. There's so many more that are in our catalog that I wish we could publish. Um, we just need more funding and, but we do plan to publish more of them over the years. And even this year, we're going to publish four in addition to the 12th. So yeah, that's kind of my spiel on Imagine 2200 Climate Fiction and why we need hopeful stories. I, um, again, uh, I think I put the book, I put the about page, good energy there. And the last thing that I want to add is maybe there's a writer on this um, call, or maybe there is a person who wants to later um, be informed when we have new stories. And so here is our link to... Like if you sign up for that email, it's not a newsletter. It's more like if we have a new story or if the collection drops or if there's something exciting about the collection. So maybe there's like seven emails a year that you'll get from us. Yeah, that's that's that email that I just dropped right there. Like the, um, it's a sign up box or whatever widget. Um, and yeah, if you want to come off mute, have a conversation, talk climate fiction or ask questions, I'd be happy to answer some. Thank you, Tori. Uh, while everybody's thinking about their questions, uh, mm -hmm. I actually have one that maybe we can start off with. Okay. Um, so you mentioned, uh, I think rightfully, that there are right now way uh, more dystopian or like challenging sort of like the world has fallen apart stories than there are these sort of like hopeful, imagination filled, um, solar punk style stories why do you think the balance is tipped in that way yeah this is a question i get a lot and i i'll talk about it but i don't have an answer you know i can only think about um what i've heard from writers is that they've found that hopeful storytelling is harder because like if you um oh, what is his name there's a uh, writer, and I can't think of his name right now because I'm on the spot, and he basically said, like, you really want to put your character through some real shit, right? Um, so I apologize for swearing. <laughs> um, uh, you really want to put your character through the ringer so that you, the viewer, can, like, you know, empathize and go through the, you're really into the story because now like, it's just, it's so tough for that character. But what I found is like, I think people were thinking of hopeful as like a hopeful story does not have to be a um, utopia, right? It can be a throughtopia where there is a little bit where your characters are um, having conflict with each other. You know, so uh, one of the things that I've seen people do with an imagined story is that they, people are living in like a shared communal kind of society or, you know, um, eco village or something like that. But there's like a big decision that needs to be decided. And some part of the folks at that camp or collective are a little bit like, I'm not so sure. And the other people are like, no, for the moral reason we have to. And then others are arguing like, I'm thinking of this story, which is an excellent story called Seven Sisters. And it is about a tea farm, a collective tea farm. And 
uh, I'm trying to tell the story without giving it away. Well, I'll give it away. I still think it's a great story, even if I give this little piece away. It's a dilemma they're having. One of the tea buyers is off, or tea sellers is off in Brazil to sell some tea and encounters a woman with a baby and decides like they need to come back because they've been, I think there was a flood or some sort of climate disaster where they're unhoused at that point. And she says, why don't you come back to and live at our collective tea farm? And at that point, they're having like these financial problems because the drones they're using have broken and they're going to have to pick tea and it's hard. And so the dilemma is, is that some people in the collective are like, of course, we want to take this woman in with her um, you know, small child, but right now is just not the right time. And then the other side. So I think that people, and this is just my like kind of feeling around this, is that people feel that utopian stories don't have conflict. So then what's the story, right? You know, like, why would that be interesting? And so if you, that's why I think this new term through topia is, it's like interesting because the idea of through topia is that it's like a blueprint to some degree. It's, it's like a blueprint, a story in showing how we moved from this place that is one that where things could be existential um, to one where it's, you know, we're getting out the other side and it's clean, green, and hopeful. So, uh, but, you know, another thing I'll tell you is that writers write to me and say, I've been writing this way for so long that's like a reflex and I know how to like, I know how to world build, build the character, all that. But writing an Imagine 2200 story helped kind of like shift me a little bit so that now I know kind of the things I need to bring into this world to make it work as a story. And they hadn't, you know, I think it's a cultural thing to some degree. I don't know why humans, uh, like we, I guess it has to go with that part is like conflict or a, a good story has great conflict. And, you know, a lot of the times I think people thought like a hopeful story has to be like totally utopian. Um, but that's just my answer be because I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have a question to pose? And you can feel free to throw it in, in the chat if you'd like. Uh, here we go. So uh, we've got someone who added in the chat. I'm wondering if you had any favorite hopeful climate fiction slash apocalyptic fiction in mind as a guiding force when developing your project. All right. So Adrian, I don't know if you know Adrian Marie Brown, but Adrian Marie Brown is a writer, a visionary, a movement activist, a artist, so many things. This um, woman has really brought, and now has a collection of probably like eight or nine books, and they're very different, um, but they're always about thinking, dreaming, or acting in a different way because the things that we're doing right now are so, are not getting us the right outcome. Um, and so she's sort of like a magician in some ways. But if you don't know Adrienne Marie Brown, she was a judge, one of our judges from the first year. And she had a collection of stories called Octavia's Brood. Not all of them are like climate fiction, they're environmental fiction but they're speculative fiction and they really do something that other science fiction, they dream in a different way. They imagine in a different way. They just move in a different way. So I would really suggest the Octavia's Brood. It's, it's, I would say, should say that it's Adrian Marie Brown and Walla D. Amarisha, who are the um, editors of the uh, book. And there's all these, they curated it. So there's these amazing um, they have really good connections. And so they know all these different people and Afrofuturists um, kind of 
uh, movement um, in other kind of speculative areas, and they bring them together in this collection was definitely something that many people told me I should check out, and so I did. And I was like, yes, this is like celebrating people. This is, I wouldn't say that all the stories are hopeful. So that's a little bit different. It wasn't until I hit like the solar punk um, genre of stories where I found a lot of hopeful stories. Um, and so another one, this is more recent, so it didn't guide the project, but you should definitely check it out. Um, it's called Another Life by Serena Ulabari. Serena Ulabari is the editor in a solar punk uh, publisher. She's a solar punk publisher, editor, and writer, and author, and commenter, and person who's kind of like really invested in the solar punk community becoming something um, bigger than it was a few years ago. And that new book, Another Life, which came out this past December, um, is a really good example of it's just solar punk. Like if you really, and it doesn't, it has, it has some magic in it. It has some kind of like these stories. That's what I also like. And I didn't get to talk about today is that I like, I often tell writers, like if you're a romance writer, you don't have to trade out your favorite genre that you already write. Just layer in something that's climate, like, you know, have that romance novel have be between like a solar panel installer and like, um, let's bring up that kelp farmer again, you know, it can still be that steamy story that you want. Um, but, but, you know, with like narratives and values that you care about, um, too. And so that's the same for just detective stories. That's the same, um, for murder mysteries or whatever you, you, they, uh, this, this person, whoever's writing, um, yeah. So those are two that I would recommend. And then if you're into speculative fiction, this is another, I checked this one out, Terraform, um, because I was searching for projects that were like Grist and like a, this This is from um, Motherboard, which is at Vice Magazine. They did this book. So I, I really wanted to see, had there been other uh, news organizations that came out with like kind of collections? And this was one that I found and was super helpful to be like, okay, so there are some other people doing this. Um, and then Octavia Butler's books, which are not like hopeful, but are kind of a, you know, founding, uh, I would say like they really are that intersectional climate fiction type stories that, um, really paved the path for like the Adrian Reed. Like if you ask any speculative fiction writer, like especially if they're black or in the BIPOC kind of like category people, they will say that uh, Octavia Butler was like one of the people that really um, was a visionary. Like there's some, like I think the term make America great again is in some of her books, you know? Um, and yeah, just like there's a lot there to chew on outside of climate, but it also has to do with climate. And so there's so much wrapped up together. Um, and so I think those 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 three books are four books that I just recommended. Um, and then Adrian Marie Brown, again, has another book that they've done more recently that I think is a more environmental fiction um, where it's like about a river as opposed to the whole climate. Um, but anything that Adrian's been doing has been great. I know that we're close to time, so I just want to leave you with one last thing. Excuse me. The One of the movements we didn't talk about that really influenced the project was the healing justice movement. Um, the NAP Ministries is a good example if you want to know what the healing justice moment is. Like the fact that we all need a little bit, not this wellness kind of pushed idea that we need to do self-care, but the idea that collectively as a society, we need better caregivers for our old people. We need more health and wellness for ourselves and act not just like taught that you need to take self-care and have the time for us to have that self-care. So you know, Mondays with no work, the four day work week, things of that nature, those showed up in our stories as well and helped guide the original kind of prompt and thinking I had at the time. Thanks, Jenna, for that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we oh, are. 
just that time, but Tori, thank you so much for all of your insights and everything that you've talked about. Um, I think it's very meaningful and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, again, we will have a recording available within the next few days. Um, we'll email that out when it's available. So uh, on behalf of the library, thank you. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thank you.